Amit, who is one of your MCs for tonight. Amit. Thank you very much, Ogo. Uh, greeting friends, my name is Ahmed Gayid. I am the Secretary Treasurer at the Ontario Federation of Labour and I wish to first acknowledge that as a settler on the ancestral territories, uh, uh, traditional territories of the Ojibwe, the Anishinaabe and the Mississauga of the Credit, I've learned that this territory is covered by the Upper Canada's treaties. I'm grateful for the opportunity to live and work here. I must acknowledge that people of African descent and Indigenous people um, have different but parallel histories on this continent. The brutality of colonialism has bound and shaped our cultures for over 500 years. However, 2020 has taught us that solidarity, one of the foundational principles of the labor movement, must exist within and between our two communities. I encourage settlers uh, to have a more meaningful and constant dialogue within their respective communities and with our Indigenous neighbours and friends to better understand the impacts of ongoing injustices and how to participate in a better future that leaves no one behind. I thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years and I ask the ancestors and of course the elders to continue to guide and watch over us. I invite interested participants tonight here to share their own personal land acknowledgement in the chat box below. Before we continue here tonight, I would like uh, for us to take a moment of silence to recognize the lives of at least 45 migrant workers lost since 2001 in Ontario, including at least three that we confirmed just last week. Please keep their families, friends, and fellow co-workers in your thoughts and your prayers. Uh, rest in power, comrades. Let's take a moment of silence and let that start now. Thank you. It's important to stress that while a review related to the deaths of temporary foreign agricultural workers in 2020 was recently released, the Office of the Chief Coroner has never held an inquest into the death of a migrant worker here in Ontario. A just and fair society means that everyone in the country and in this province has the same rights. That means everyone in the country and province must have access to worker rights and protections, as well as permanent status on arrival or pathways to permanent residency, We'll expand on these options in part uh, of this webinar series. For now, I'm sure many of you will recall that uh, the recent crisis, uh, which was happening in Windsor, Essex, where hundreds of workers contracted COVID-19. Two died and many others described the inhumane conditions that they uh, experienced uh, and that they had to work in. This is why the Ontario Federation of Labour collaboratively with Justice for Migrant Workers UFCW, Migrant Workers Alliance for Change, the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, and Ryerson University is pleased to hold the first tonight uh, in a three-part series on the experiences of Ontario migrant workers. Tonight, we will hear from agricultural uh, migrant workers on their lived work experience and the challenges and barriers faced uh, and that they face daily, not just in their daily job, but especially now during this pandemic, during COVID-19, as they work each and every single day to put food on our tables for our families and to feed our communities. I'm thrilled to be co-moderating tonight's event and conversation uh, on the experiences of migrant workers with my good friend and the ONDP's selected candidate in Scarborough Rouge, uh, Rouge Park for the 2022 provincial election, Felicia Samuel. Felicia sits on the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario Provincial Executive Committee and is also a member of the Ontario Federation of Labour Worker of Colour Committee. Welcome, Felicia, and uh, she's all yours. Thanks, Ahmed. And it's a pleasure to be co-moderating with you, and I'm looking forward to this panel this evening. Every year, tens of thousands of migrant agricultural workers come to Canada from Mexico the Caribbean and other countries to grow, harvest and process Canadian food products. However, despite their tremendous contributions to Canada's food sector, some migrant workers experience mistreatment by employers 
and endure other forms of abuse. As some of you are aware, Ontario is on the heels of a provincial election and there is much that needs to be discussed about the groundwork we need to lay to ensure that by 2022, we have a government that is committed to transformative change and takes action to challenge injustice and address barriers for migrant workers. Before we begin the conversation, please note that the Ontario Federation of Labour is committed to providing an inclusive, positive environment at all Federation activities and ensuring that all individuals are treated with respect and dignity. The Ontario Federation of Labour does not condone or tolerate hateful messages from attendees that are racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, or ableist, nor any language that is discriminatory or violent in its intent. As such, we reserve the right to expel any attendees from our event that contribute to this type of behavior. A link to the OFL equality guidelines has been posted in the chat for your reference. Thank you for your cooperation. Back to you, Amit. Thanks, Felicia. Uh, we'll go to a brief video that uh, uh, we'll watch together. They are crucial in getting food on your table. Migrant workers who are on the job during the COVID-19 pandemic. And there are reports that there are hundreds of cases at these farms here in Ontario as advocates are calling on the government to step in. Our concerns and our pleas for support were met with, uh, with silence. And uh, this is as a result of the last couple of weeks, we've only seen a, a tremendous spike in the cases of agricultural workers in general, but specifically migrant agricultural workers. According to Justice for Migrants, 442 farm workers have contracted the virus. Seven have been hospitalized. And the advocacy group says it expects numbers to continue climbing as there are fears and concerns expressed by precarious workers. They came to Canada well and they, they want to know how and what steps can be taken to protect them. They want to know, will there, housing, uh, will there be housing inspections? Will there be workplace inspections? Uh, they don't believe that what's being done is in their best interest, only that of the employers. The group says proper inspections aren't taking place. In some jurisdictions, employers would just need to provide photos or videos of the accommodations in order to get approval from the province, a concern they say they want the Ministry of Labour to address. It also doesn't appear that the province is keeping integrated data on migrant workers during the pandemic. The ministry says employers aren't required to notify the province if a worker contracted the virus, unless they were certain it was while working. Many workers are fearful of speaking out because they're afraid, afraid of reprisals. The NDP says its researchers estimate there are anywhere between 240 to 441 active cases, saying that the lack of protections in place for migrant workers is being exposed by the pandemic. Pandemic. Congregant living situations, bunkhouses where uh, they, they live together and share small spaces together, the uh, lack of personal protective equipment, the lack of sanitary stations in and around their workplaces, the close contact that they have in the field or in areas uh, that they work. So there you have it, folks. Um, it's no longer a secret that for decades, Canada has been built on injustices against Indigenous people, against the Chinese uh, and the railway workers, and now migrant farm workers. The harsh reality is under Canada's near 55-year-old seasonal agricultural worker program, migrant workers are being dehuman dehumanized and exploited. While migrant farm workers, for instance, are here to do jobs, Canadians do not want to do. They have no rights, no status, and no choice but to be tied to a work permit to one employer. The system is carefully designed to create fear rather than build an environment of hope and equality and fairness. And uh, it, it pains me to say that. With that, um, perhaps uh, I'll flip it to Felicia to uh, introduce our first panelist of the night so we can start talking about some of these injustices and experiences uh, and hear firsthand from migrant workers. Felicia? 
Thanks, Ahmed. So it is my pleasure to introduce Tracy Ann Hines. Tracy Ann is a former migrant worker and active member of Justice for Migrant Workers. She has been active in community forums, panel discussions at George Brown College, Toronto College, and general discussions about the intersection between gender, gender and migration. Tracy has also participated in additional meetings with co-chairs of the Changing Workplace Review and has been part of various press conferences to convey the reforms needed to help vulnerable workers in Ontario. Good evening and welcome, Tracy. In 2012, farm worker and activist Gabriel Aladua received an opportunity to work in Canada as a migrant farm worker. It was a welcomed opportunity for Gabriel who was left unemployed and with a young family to support in his home country of St. Lucia after a severe hurricane destroyed his livelihood in 2010. Gabriel, welcome. Thank you. Alvaro Gutierrez is a migrant worker from Mexico. He arrived in Canada in 2015 under the Temporary Foreign Workers Program to work in a greenhouse in Windsor, Essex County until he left his former employer in 2020. Alvaro has been advocating for human and labor rights of migrant farm workers in Southern Ontario. Welcome, Alvaro. Keisha Marshall is a migrant worker from Barbados and has worked in the hotel sector when she arrived in Canada. Keisha works uh, with Justicia to advocate for safe and health, uh, healthy and equitable working conditions for all migrant workers across Ontario. Welcome, Keisha. And of Thank course, you. yes, welcome. And of course, welcome to everyone attending here tonight, all of our participants uh, who've uh, taken the time out of their, uh, their afternoon and evening to join us here for this important conversation. Thank you for joining. Please note, based on their comfort level, some of our panelists uh, will, um, uh, panelists will and OFL's commitment to providing a safe and working, uh, a safe and working space for dialogue. Some members of our panel will not appear on, uh, on video for their safety. We will have uh, a question and answer period in this session and uh, we have staff monitoring the Q&A box for your questions. So feel free to post some questions. This is a conversation we were hoping to have it a little bit more interactive so we can have some dialogue coming from our audience as well. And we'll do our best to answer as many as we can, uh, obviously before the end of the evening uh, and with the time that we have allotted. With that in mind, let's just jump right into the conversation. So perhaps uh, I can ask this first question to all of our panelists. Um, when you first learned that you were coming to Canada uh, to work, uh, what did you imagine the opportunity would look like? What would it be like? Uh, what were your dreams coming to Canada? Um, perhaps uh, first I'll pose that question uh, to Gabe, Gabriel, um, but it is for all of our panelists. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, extra special greetings to each and everyone in Zoom land tonight. Thanks for allowing me to your home. Um, a couple of things. When I first got to know that I was coming to Canada, I had no idea that I was coming, I was walking into something. It was like jumping into something that I have no idea of the rules. I had no idea I was jumping into something that was so complicated that it is extremely difficult to understand. I have no idea that it is so difficult that it is difficult to navigate. I had no idea that it, is, it was impossible, and up to now, impossible to get justice from me. That is how I felt. But in my home country, red and white means love. And on a two occasions, Canada has been so good to me at very two important stages in my life. Canada has been really, really good to me in my home country. Now I got the opportunity to come to Canada. I, I was in, within myself, I'm saying, if Canada was so good to me in my home country, how much more good things is awaited for me now that I've come to Canada? Can you put those words, can you put that feeling into words? And another important thing is <clears throat> in my home country, I was at the lowest point in my life, the lowest economic point in my life. I felt really small, like this cow there. And I felt that opportunity to come to Canada. Economically, I felt small, my pocket was small. And getting that opportunity to come and earn my livelihood in Canada, I felt I would be like a cow feeding on grass and in a couple of months, 
and a couple of months of that program, I felt that I would be able to work my way out of poverty. That's how I felt. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that experience, Gabriel. Really appreciate that and the visuals as well. Thank you. Um, perhaps uh, I'll go to uh, Alvaro. Yep. Okay. Same question. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, uh, first of all, say everybody hi. Um, I just want to recognize all the effort that you did for uh, have all these people here. Um, I think it's time for share uh, all this experience. Um, I'm still learning the, the language, so I, I need to ask you patience for um, a couple of things, but uh, I'm trying. And, and I, uh, uh, well, just to say that uh, all, the, all the dreams and all the things that I've been thinking about Canada, uh, first of all, I start to research. Uh, a couple of things, and, and I have a totally different idea about uh, how it's working here. So uh, eventually I find an agency and, and came to Canada and uh, nobody tell me never what kind of work uh, I was, uh, uh, I'd be able to do in here. So uh, my experience, it was uh, totally uncomfortable, you know? But uh, in my mind, I, I was, thinking in my family, in my daughter, the, uh, the, uh, the conditions of the, the life in, in, in Mexico, it's so, so complicated right now for, for the woman. And they are being disappearing. My daughter, it's, uh, it's just so beautiful. And I decide to sacrifice everything and, and try everything. Uh, it doesn't matter if, uh, if these things uh, going uh, against me. So uh, I came in here and uh, the first thing that I feel when I start to work in the greenhouse is was, well, I, I'm in jail and uh, I stay in that way for uh, four years. And uh, a lot of stories of abuse against me, against uh, a lot of workers and until I said, well, uh, I need to do something else. And well, that, that, that was my first experience uh, with Canada. And I'm trying to every day uh, be better. Uh, right now, uh, I really appreciate uh, the light outside uh, right now in my home. I really appreciate uh, that my daughter can go to school, um, but never, Nobody uh, give me anything, no, even a uh, little advice or how to do it when you came in here. So it's a, it's a complicated way. Uh, and all the workers inside the greenhouse are suffering the same conditions. Um, I was living in there with 30 people. Uh, sometimes I, I live with uh, six people in the same room, very small rooms. So uh, that is just one idea. Uh, what is um, what was our chances uh, when this COVID came to Canada and started to spreading around it? So that that was my my first impression. So <laughs> thank you, Alvaro, and uh, I understood you perfectly. No apology necessary for your English. Uh, you speak better English than I speak any other language. So <laughs> thank you for that. And thanks for sharing that experience, uh, you know, coming from one difficult situation um, into what you thought might be a better situation, but what proved to be another difficult situation. So thanks for sharing that uh, experience with us. Uh, perhaps I can go to uh, Tracy Ann. Same question. When you first learned you're coming to Canada uh, to work, what did you imagine the opportunity would look like when you arrived to work here? Good evening, everyone. Growing up in my country, I had a rough life with just my mom and my two siblings. I was working in a, in a pharmacy and I couldn't even save towards building up my future or even upgrade my education because of the, because of the cost of high living. In 2013, I received the opportunity to come to Canada on the seasonal program for two years. It was my first time being away from my family 
so long in a strange country. I was pretty excited at first with high expectation because I thought that Canada was a country that treated everyone fairly, no matter the color of their skin and their status. When I arrived in Canada, I start work. I start to work. And when I arrive in Canada and start to work, everything changes. I never knew that the job that I was doing was the job that Canadian refused to do. I would be living in a small little room on a bunk bed with six females with only one washroom and one cooking stove, working 10 to 15 hours in a warehouse, packing, labeling, and keep clipping vegetable stem during night while Canadians are in their bed sleeping without any day off, working like a robot machine and such. And so that when I am moving, when I am moving slow from the employer, as a migrant worker, you are classified as low standard people, look like a trash because of the job you are doing. You are the one who made the sacrifice to leave your family so you can able to support and provide for, for your family. Missing out a lot of your kids growing up and ensure that food and vegetables are on Canadian table. And yet still you are treated as slaves. When I got injured because of the constant repellent work I was doing on my right arm, I, during that process, I fell all alone to fight on my own in a strange country. As a migrant worker, you don't have the right to speak out or even complain about your injury that occurs on the job. You are doing, you are doing from that moment. And when you, when you, when you complain that moment, you will have an army to fight against you. You will be quickly sent packing to go back to your country. And sometimes, sometimes I wonder if the employer work with the airline because how quickly they send you on the plane. There is no protection from the government for us as migrant workers. Time after time, workers are injured, even refuse to do unsafe work. And they don't even get a chance to tell their story because they are afraid to speak out and they are not getting the chance to return on the program. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Tracy. And, and of course, again, it, Canadians, we like to pride ourselves on the fairness and the equality and so on uh, that we, uh, we experience here in this country. But of course, Tracy Ann, you experienced something else. You experienced some inequalities based on your race and other experiences. So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, we truly appreciate your experience. And uh, we all know um, how important the work that uh, migrant uh, workers do uh, that when they come to this country. Um, so thank you very much for what you do. Uh, and of course, Keisha, I'll give you the opportunity to uh, answer the same question. Hi, good night. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Keisha. Good night. Hi. For me, my experience, where I was already working in the hotel field. So I meet the nicest of Canadians down here in Barbados. And when I heard about the opportunity, one of my friends mentioned it to me. So she asked me, Keisha, you don't want to go and apply to this program to go on the Canadian sure, program? Sure. So I was like, no. But then I still went ahead and applied. I meet the nicest of recruiters. Well, so I thought I get recruit onto the program. Everything was good. I was like, oh my God, opportunity to work in a country, an international country, quite always in love with Canada because I came down there in 2008. So I was always in love, but down there I was always like, yes, let me jump to this opportunity. But then when I get down there, when we get to the airport, everything was nice. Everybody was welcoming and everything. But from the time the first day of work, it was something else totally different. I have never worked so hard in my life till I actually work at that company. And for me, I feel like we were always given the most because we were known as the best workers. So all the things that the Canadians were refusing, we were getting. And it was a horrible experience, at least this time around, because it was down there from the 2018 program into the 2019. And then it came back again from 2020 into the 2021. But I leave before the program was over because of COVID. So it was a horrible experience to me. 
from the way that we were treated like and then maybe speak out against it is like no matter what you say nothing is getting done from staff housing staff housing was horrible because we were we were supposed to be sharing rooms and so and the condition when we first get into the staff housing the first night it had like rat droppings in the staff housing it had drink stains all over the ground the coaches and things were staying up and different things and we complained about those and we were here oh the room was inspecting already before you guys come down I'm not sure what type of inspection was that and then from there I, I asked like a couple of days after I told the lady well, I'm not sleeping on a bunk bed I'm a big person so I'm not sleeping on no bunk bed I too old to be sleeping on a bunk bed so after I complained about it, she told me about go ahead and sign my paperwork and so on. I went ahead and sign the paperwork and so on for the staff housing and so. She told me something's going to be done, but nothing was ever done. So after COVID was about to hit, then I asked to come home because the company provided the transportation down and up. So I asked to come home and the lady was like, no, if you want to leave, you have to provide your own transportation fees to the airport and then you have to provide your own plane ticket back to your island. I was like, you're serious? So then from there, it was just one big horrible, horrible mess on today. Leave the program in November, in December, sorry. Thank you very much for that, Keisha. Thank you for sharing your experience again. Um, you know, having some hopes of coming to Canada, being recruited to a program which you thought was going to be an excellent experience. Didn't turn out exactly to what you thought it would be, whether it was the, the working conditions and being overworked and your housing conditions. Uh, and um, I'm sorry you had to go through that, but thank you very much for sharing that experience. Of course, we heard from you that uh, even during COVID, the experience, yeah, the experience got worse, right? Yes. Yes, please. And I was done, as I said before, on the 2018 to the 2019 program. But when I come back this time around, these people actually show you one different face. It's almost like these people just change. These were not the same people that we leave in 2019. They start treating you so bad. You can't get nothing. Every time that you complain about issue, nothing is getting done. You reach out to liaison services and nothing is getting done either. So it's almost like everybody like them in one pocket. And no matter whatever the employees say, nothing is ever getting done. Thank you, Chair. Felicia? Thanks, Simon. So Gabriel, I have a question for you. You arrived in Canada on a typically cold January day. Through the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program, which allows Canadian companies to hire temporary foreign workers from Mexico or the Caribbean for eight months at a time. Can you describe your immediate experience on arrival and what life has been like since then? as a migrant worker in Canada? Thank you for a powerful question. I hope you give me one hour to answer that question <laughs> because it's a cold January night when I arrived. But in life, I, was, I, I get to understand in life to make progress, you have to be uncomfortable. You have to make yourself, you have to prepare yourself to be uncomfortable, to, to bring change, to step out of your comfort zone. And that's how my day started. I got out of bed that, that day I traveled to Canada, my first time, I got out of bed very, very early in the morning, which is unusual. So I started by making myself uncomfortable. And 24 hours later, I got to the farm two or three o'clock in the morning, 24 hours. So I started under the cover of darkness and I got to the farm, my destination, under the cover of darkness. And that was, that was just the highlight of my, of my, of that program. When I, I thought I was making myself uncomfortable for, for growth and so on, and for a better world, but trust me, the moment I stepped out of the airport was the day, the moment I received my biggest slap across my face. I wasn't prepared and so were the, my other colleagues. We were not prepared for that kind of weather. It was the 17th of January, it was in the night. We were not prepared for that kind of weather. Nor was my government representative who was at the airport helping us to do our paperwork, nor did they bring any appropriate clothing, nor did they check that we, we had appropriate clothing. And to make it worse, when, what I thought was a temporary discomfort, to make it worse, we took a four hour bus ride from Pierce to the airport all the way to Limitan on a bus without any running heater. Four hours in the night. To make it worse, the, the driver ended up 
putting us off in the wrong bunkhouse where there, were, there was no heat, the beds were turned upside down, the place wasn't prepared for us. That was the wrong bunkhouse. That is where we spent the rest of the night. And that was our welcome to Canada. I thought that was just temporary discomfort and I was okay for that. But that was just a prelude of what was to come. Our living and working condition was no better. And that was just a prelude of what was to come. In, in the bunkhouse where I live, it was 62 of us sharing free stalls with 13 burners. If you do the mathematics, you would see 13 burners to 62 guys each of us preparing our own meals. That tells you something. We had one television for 62 guys. Up to now, this bunkhouse has no internet to communicate with our family. That, that was just our living condition. In my room, there were eight of us sharing one room, no privacy. That was just a little about living condition. But where is our house? Right on the farmer's property. We had a farmer's property. And Eight of us to one bunk, to one room, 62 of us in one bunk out. Isn't that the recipe for COVID to spread? Is it surprising how, um, well, look at the number of deaths that, that we've, we've, we've been suffering. Is that surprising? That's just a reflection. According to, to somebody who put it so nicely, COVID has exposed Canada's dirty secret. And in terms of working conditions, I started counting. Because, because my program started with some discomfort, and I thought the discomfort was temporary, but then when I realized it's going on, it's going on, I started counting. And I counted up to 20 injustices, and this is what I call the 20 dark side, the 20 dark sides of Canada. And those injustices are every, every, every level of Canadian government. And will I be a spectator and watch, or would I be a player and fight? Tonight, I want to push you to take action. Thank you. Thank you for that, Gabriel. And I'm so sorry to hear about your experience coming to Canada, but I'm appreciative that you're a fighter and that you're sharing your stories with us this evening. Go ahead, Amin, back to you. Yes, thank you, Gabriel, and thank you, Felicia. Alvaro, the next question is for you. Um, you faced some immense challenges while working in Canada during COVID-19. Um, so during this pandemic, you had some experiences. Can you speak to the health and safety concerns uh, that the coronavirus has presented for migrant uh, agricultural workers? Oh, you're on. You're on mute, brother. We can't hear you. There you go. Um, right now, I'm uh, working in a different place. Uh, but I know uh, what is the conditions or, or the health conditions in the in the greenhouse. No, so uh, eventually I we realized that Canada was not prepared for the for all this COVID. No, and uh, especially especially because um, if you want to change the weather inside to the the house where or the bunker house. Well, you cannot do it. it uh, it's not allowed for you. It's, uh, the manager have a, a lock uh, for to move uh, what is the, the uh, air conditioner or if you want to put heat or uh, different things, no? So uh, we live with 30 people in the same house. So when somebody or one of these guys uh, suffering flu, everybody start to have a flu, you know? So uh, uh, these guys uh, still text me and ask me uh, for different things, uh, for a little bit of help because uh, the language, it's a, it's a barrier uh, with the rest of the people in Canada. So uh, even uh, if we go to the doctor, it's, uh, we cannot share entirely well uh, what we are suffering or what, what is happening inside to the bunker house. And uh, some of these guys have afraid to share things with the doctors because the doctors share all the information with the managers. So after that, uh, the managers start to have uh, take a decisions about uh, the workers that constantly have a disease or sickness for different things. And uh, we realized in that moment that we cannot share uh, what is happening. And, and eventually that's why uh, I can imagine that uh, uh, some of these Mexicans guys or Guatemalan guys 
uh, are dying in there because they don't want to say anything and and the conditions are are pretty nasty you know for 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 everybody it's totally different in the place where i'm working now they are trying to explain you explaining you that uh, uh, you need to stay away from the people you need to use the mask they provide everything you no know, for um, uh, for to try to keep you safe um, in the greenhouse never happened that uh, always, uh, if you want to ask for a mask, well, there's, that goes against you because it's uh, the manager start to think that you are one of those guys that's, that complains for everything. Uh, sometimes you need gloves and you cannot even ask for them, no? So uh, what is going to happen if uh, this principle, this PPE is the, the first thing that you have against to the COVID and the greenhouse is not available for to give it to you. So uh, right now we know that it's a disaster. You no, know? uh, the completely uh, or the entire greenhouse go to isolation because uh, everybody was sick or everybody were sick or half of the people go to a hotel for isolation. And, there, and then the rest of the guys go for us isolation because, because several of those guys are sick, you know? So you just could imagine uh, what is all this, when you mix all these situations uh, and you put in the middle of the, the middle, the virus, you no, know? it's a, um, I don't know, it's a completely disaster. Absolutely. and. <laughs> We think it's absolutely shameful that, you know, uh, an employer who uh, is putting you in some working conditions where you can't change the temperature um, and, you know, they're, you know, be getting information from the doctors that are helping you try and stay healthy uh, are sort of uh, punishing you or have some consequences uh, based on if you ask for personal protective equipment, if you ask for a mask or gloves. Uh, it's absolutely shameful. It's shameful that uh, they are thinking that people are complaining that you go to the doctor to stay safe and healthy so that you can continue to work. Absolutely shameful. Thank you for sharing that um, experience with us. Again, I have a question for Tracy Ann. Tracy Ann, what are the challenges migrant workers face in terms of limited access or no access to health care, paying into EI, and other services, but not receiving the benefits and general lack of access to basic necessities. So as migrant workers, there are many challenges that they are facing. They have to work long hours. They have to, they, they work with, uh, without day off and even over time and, and not getting their pay. And the government use the migrant worker program to exploit the workers by abusing their rights as, and, and forcing them to be undocumented before they are able to receive EI benefits. From their own money, they have been paying years after years. Because we all know that um, the migrant worker program is a yearly thing. Most of them, they, they, all of them, they spend most of their time here in Canada paying taxes every year. And, and yes, still, the government put put a high standard, a high bar against for them to receive um, EI because they are classified as temporary. And we all know that temporary is something that's not gonna last long. So they are not Canadian or permanent resident, they are temporary. And even during this COVID pandemic, a lot of workers, they are greatly affected. In Right now in Canada and even the workers who are in their own country, who do they get the opportunity to come back because of what is going on even now? And yes, still even in that time, the government don't, don't try to access that money for them because you know, a lot of them, they come on the program because they don't have any work in their country. No one is not gonna just leave their family and come to a country to work. You come because you have a need. You want to be able to support your family. So you made that big sacrifice to come here to work. And yes, still, 
you you don't get the 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 money the, your own money that you have been paying years after years so my understanding is i know there are so many canadians even here who some of them don't they don't even work from their barn and yet still some of them they are able to access that ei and migrant workers they are not able to access this they put up big barriers for them not to able to access this even when you get injured you and your health card is cut off and you're not able to get quality health care because when your health care is, is cut off you're left all alone you're not able to receive double siv and many of the workers they don't even get the chance to even go to see a doctor they are quickly sent home so what about those people who are back in their own country or even those who are here who is trying to able to to get healthcare coverage what about them what are what are the what are the the what the government is doing to to make a change for those people because you know that um every year you always have persons dying because of unsafe work and I, to me it's sickening to know that every year you heard on the news another migrant worker another what are they doing to try to prevent all of these from happening and um and even in this time where you know they 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 normally would be here in canada because of what is happening why is it they are not able to access that money because they would have get the opportunity to be here but because of what is happening they are not so why is it it's so hard for them to able to let them access that money that they have been paying year after year thank you thanks tracy you made tracy and you made so many great points there and really the question what is the government doing there are so many gaps here that need to be addressed and again we're coming up to an election so definitely some topics for discussion and for us to push back on in support of you all thank you thank you um, next question, we'll go to Alvaro. Um, you alluded to the fact a little bit earlier, you've changed jobs. So having worked in ag agriculture and now in a unionized workplace, what is the difference you've personally experienced? How would unionization help migrant farm workers improve their precarious conditions or their poor working conditions? Well, it's, um, it's totally different. What is, uh what are the rights that the Canadians have and, and what the rights or no rights that the, the migrant workers have inside to the greenhouse. So uh, it's, uh, for example, uh, you have a day off uh, uh, in the greenhouse. Sometimes they give me a paper that they want to sign and that say that I'm just a, uh, uh, renounced to my day off uh, during the week. Uh, the first time when I came in can Canada, I never have a day off during the first six or seven months. I was working with uh, with cucumbers, and uh, the co the cucumbers, you know, uh, need to be uh, you need to harvesting uh, every day, every day, uh, because the cucumber uh, uh, requires a special size for 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 the packers and if uh, you don't uh, harvesting that cucumber uh, the next day for them is garbage so they are specialized in the aesthetic even in the aesthetic of the of the cucumber you know so uh, uh, that is not that that not happen with the with the workers uh, in Canada when they feel sick they just call and say I'm sick uh, some of these uh, unions have, uh, uh, you can use your, uh, not just your health card, even they can give it to you uh, for fix your teeth, or they can give you massage, or they can give you, provide you for, for a different things. And that kind of things, uh, the my workers doesn't have, no? Uh, one day I wake up and uh, I was thinking, uh, bring my family, and I was thinking uh, probably I need to buy a car because everything is too, too expensive in here. And if you want to move 
from one point to another uh, and you spend your money in taxes, uh, well, it's, uh, it's a lot of money. So uh, I was thinking in that. And uh, I think that the manager at some point figured out that I was trying to do that and stick a, 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 like a flyer saying that uh, it's not allowed for, for the migrant work workers have car. Uh, so uh, that kind of things goes uh, against to, I don't know how many rights, no? So uh, it's, and uh, I think, uh, the owners, uh, they know what is happening in there and they know that they go against the right of the workers. And, uh, but they do it because it's allowed that the, uh, for the way that they bring, bring us to work here in Canada. Because you have a, a work permit that, uh, uh, and you, st uh, stay, uh, you are tied to the owner, you know? And if you don't like it, that work, well, uh, you cannot just jump with another, with another owner. So uh, these kind of things for that little experience, you cannot do it with, uh, uh, don't happen to the Canadians, no? If they don't like it, they say, well, I just can't just jump to a different job or do something else, or I'm I have different skills, I'm, uh, and I can say, well, I can do something else that, that little things don't happen with the migrant workers. Even if you have, if you know a different language, it's like a threat for, for the owner, no? That depends how the owner think about you. If the owner says, well, probably this guy, I, uh, I can have it to my side, it's good for him. But if no, um, probably it's a big, big threat, no? Even, um, well, that it is. Thank you for that, Alvaro. I, I heard you mention like your employer in agriculture, you know, while working non-union, of course, is prioritizing their business, prioritizing the size of cucumbers, trying to make you sign off your rights so that you would have to work pretty much every day of the year, right? Like that's, uh, that's kind of scary to hear those types of things. So, of course, it sounds like working in a unionized environment, much better for you. You have some health benefits that come along with that, that get negotiated and other, uh, other benefits, I'm sure, that come along with joining, uh, joining being, uh, having representation. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. Keisha, I have a question for you now. Uh, your experience is actually as a worker in the hotel sector. Can you speak to the working and housing conditions you faced when you arrived in your place of employment? Well, for me, my experience was we were living, it was this year, it was only 10 of us that came down this year because the other set was supposed to come down after us. That was supposed to be 30 more employees, but because of the whole COVID that it was dry gone for a little while. So then come down in October 20, 2020. So at one point I complained, I was the only person, me and a younger person that was in the unit with me. We were, we were the two that were given bunk beds. I explained to the lady, well, I cannot sleep on a bunk bed because my head is basically touching the roof. The ladder is too straight for me to climb on properly and I don't have nothing to like grab on if I fall. I only have the mattress. So the lady told me, well, there's nothing that she can do for me. And I don't understand that because how are you telling me that I'm paying rent and there's nothing that you can do for me? Anyhow, for my safety, I decided, you know what? I'm going to sleep on the upstairs upstairs is known as the public spaces because everybody has their own personal room two people per room but you have to share the it's a shared living space so i decided to sleep up there for a few but it went on for three weeks actually so then after the covid hit they tell us that we have to separate and everybody the people that are sharing have to move into the hotel part so we get to, i was sleeping in the hotel for a week I mean, for like almost two months. So I was given my own hotel room. Nobody was supposed to come over to the hotel room or nothing like that. Or we were told that if anybody come to the hotel room, we were, we would have to get put off property. So at least we don't have that much people in the, the housing. We had like, this time around was 10. Last year for me, it was eight. But some others had like 12 people living in the staff housing, up to 11 sometimes. So it wasn't as packed as the other guy Gabriel was speaking on earlier. So at least it wasn't bad. 
and we were a housekeeper. So normally we used to clean it behind ourselves and then we tried to keep it as clean as possible and so. So at least it wasn't bad to some points, but nothing that you complain about, like having issues in your house, nothing is never done. Thank you for that. And it really is important for us to hear what the living conditions are like for you all. You all are coming here and doing some important work for us. You're helping us put food in our tables and you barely have a place that's comfortable to sleep. No, because to me, I was not sleeping comfortably double because I leave for Barbados so I didn't have anxiety I leave down there with anxiety because you know you're stressing you got we were working like at some point because a lot of Canadians were still home so we get called back up before the Canadians so for some reason the hotel was booked because everybody in it just couldn't wait to get back out after COVID well during COVID so they just want to get away from the house for a few days so the hotel was packed so some days we were working six days we were rusted to work six days and sometimes we start work from 8 45 in the morning and all six o'clock seven o'clock we still at work working so after working such a long day all you need to do is come home and have a proper night rest and that is something that i wasn't getting when it was there yes you call you go to the employer well you know that i'm working hard and all you're hearing all the time oh yes we understand that you guys work hard you guys are good workers so if i'm such a good worker away I can't get someplace proper to sleep if you ask say well your bed is too hard or something so you're going to hear oh you have to go online Walmart to get something for your bed everything is online Walmart nothing is never ever done thank you for that additional input and information and again it's a lot of talk saying what you do matters but the actions and showing you that are not lining up and that's something that needs to change no never not from this company hey Amit you can ask the next question thanks thanks Keisha you're muted Amit And of course, uh, you can answer that, Gabriel. No, I'm kidding. Um, I asked the question, but I'll do it again. Gabriel, there is a, a great quote from you uh, from 2019 where you say, Canada was built on the silence of good people. I am loud because you are silent, end quote. Can you expand and contextualize that train of thought for everyone here tonight? Thank you for that question. I want to tell you now, it's because of your silence. I want to tell you that it's because of your silence. You never warned me about the difficult working conditions that migrant workers face in Canada. That is why I am in Canada. And because of that, in my five minutes, I will decide whether I'll punish you and everyone in Zoomland tonight, <laughs> or whether I'll reward everyone. Because what happened is, I have this here. And what is this here? Canada consistently, 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 Canada has have always had programs in place to dehumanize and exploit people. You touch some of them at the, at the starting, right? And these things continue up to now. Um, the residential school, right? Can you imagine that? The Truth and Reconciliation Commission is calling on you and me to do 94 things, 93 things, 93 calls to action to make right those injustices. Did you ever tell me about that? 93, not 10, not 20 calls to action, not 20, 93. That tells the depth of injustice that exists in Canada. Did you tell me anything about that? I'll decide whether I'll punish you or whether I'll reward you. What about the Chinese railroad workers? It is estimated over 17,000 Chinese came to, to, to build the foundation of Canada. At the end, what happened? Were they welcome? They were used, they were abused, and at the end, they were refused, right? Did you tell me anything about that? If you look at the 60s scope, THC, what is THC? The home children. I didn't even know about that, Ahmed. You never told me about it. I'll decide whether I'll punish you, Ahmed, or whether I'll reward you, Ahmed. The THC, what is that? The home children. It is estimated that over 100,000 children were taken from orphanages in England. Can you imagine that? Children without parents coming to Canada. Isn't that the recipe for exploitation? That's why, Ahmed, when you look around you, a lot of the wealth that we see is off the back 
of free labor, cheap labor, disposable. The seasonal agriculture workers program, 55 years old. I came in 2012, nobody said anything to me about that program. I will decide whether I'll punish you or whether I'll reward you, Ahmed. I want to tell you also, <clears throat> I want to tell you also that <clears throat> the politicians, you know what they're saying? That's not an issue in my writing. That is not an issue in my right. Nobody's calling them up. Why is that so? Because why is that so? When we buy local, when we buy local, we're forgetting that the people who produce our fruits, the people who produce our vegetables. And when you go to Niagara Falls, the wine that you drink, Ahmed, and when you go to PEI, the seafoods that you eat, Ahmed, once migrant workers are involved, there are 20 injustices. But what, what does that say? You only see the nice fruits and nice vegetables. But what you don't see, that the whole program, the program that brings us to Canada, it is built on fear. There's a lot of fear built in there. A lot of fear built in there. And I can tell you some of the cases of, just one example, I think Tracy and touched that. It's so easy for them to put us on the next flight back home. Can you imagine our employers, our employees, they own the travel agency that's booking our flight in and out of Canada. Our employees are literally CBSA. There's a lot of fear. The moment you speak up, they send you back home. Now listen to that. To make us compliant, to make us compliant, they use fear and so many other things. Where is that happening, Ahmed? In the US or in Canada? Right there. And what is Canada known as? Canada is known as a country with a culture of silence. Nobody speaks up. That is why I'll decide whether I'll punish you or whether I'll reward you. And is that an illegal program? That has the full blessing of government. That This program has the full blessing of government. Who speaks about that? Nobody. That is why I'm so happy to be on this program because of, as a result of this program, people are getting to know. And again, because of COVID, Canada's dirty secret is being exposed. I want to thank you. Thank you so much for that, Gabriel. And I hope, I hope, I hope I don't receive the wrath or the punishment you, uh, you mentioned. I hope that uh, we're rewarded, obviously, by having these difficult conversations, listening to these experiences, of course, not just the experiences of migrant workers during this pandemic, but all the experiences and all of the historical atrocities that have happened here in Canada. These are things that we need to talk about. And I am, um, you're right on point with pointing them all out. Um, you know, an, another quote or a, a phrase I've heard before, Gabriel, silence is violence. If you're, if you're not gonna be vocal about something, um, you are complicit. So thank you for pointing that out. And uh, I hope I hope we all get the reward. Another phrase that uh, we say in the labor movement, injury to one is an injury to all. So <laughs> we don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to injure anybody. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for that. And uh, I, 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 I can't say enough. I like how uh, you present um, and uh, you share your experiences and the visuals. Felicia. Yeah, I have to concur. As a teacher, Gabriel, I really, I really appreciated the visuals. So thank you for that. Thank you for educating us, re-educating us on our history. Thank you. So um, we've been uh, we've been monitoring the chat box tonight, and I know it's been busy in there. Uh, we've had our whole team sort of looking at questions that are coming up and whatnot. So we're gonna try and get to some of those. Uh, I know some of you have some, some important questions to ask our panelists. Uh, so perhaps um, I can pose some of them. Some of them are directed directly to a panelist and some are just more broad if anyone wishes to answer them. Uh, but maybe we'll go to the first question here. Um, would it be helpful uh, for migrant workers in Ontario to have a, a website uh, with all of the information about their employment rights, about the uh, health card, housing, et cetera. If there's one central hub, one place that migrant workers uh, that are coming to Canada can sort of click a button and go to, would that be helpful? Um, I'll open that up uh, to any panelist here, but just based on all of your experiences and what you thought and when you were coming to Canada. So who would like to answer that? I, was, I would like to start off. I want to sure. say a couple of things. Our, uh, my colleague there, um, um, Alv Alvaro, 
he speaks Spanish. You notice that he's learning the language and he's, he's getting along, right? It takes time. So if I, would, you, would you be surprised if I tell you 75% or more of the workers of the program are Spanish speaking? And would you be surprised if I tell you that the contracts they hand to them is in English, not in the language? What would a, a website do for these workers? It is, it, it, the system does not cater for us, right? And also, I need to tell you, a lot of the other workers, even the English speaking workers, even in, for me, I'm from an English speaking country, but English is like a second language to most of my colleagues from my home country. We were seven times colonized by France and seven times by England. Whereas on, on paper, we are English, but we um, um, Creole, French Creole is like our mother tongue. We, we, we communicate in that fluently, easily, and um, our contracts are given to us in English. So what, do, what, what would information in English be to somebody who's, who's struggling with English? That is one. The other thing too, the way the website is presented, it, it's presented like it's a cure. It would cure the problem. The, the website will give information, no problem. I don't have a problem accessing information, but how do you access it when language is one barrier? And also, also, even though you access the information, it does not take away from the fact that, the, what is the program? What is the program really? Listen to that, what is the program really? What are the three pillars of the program? We are tied to our employer. The first pillar of the program, we are tied to our employer. By, by having information, does that take away the fact by being, you're tied to your employer? Does it take away the fact that, look at the branches, what is the branch? We cannot apply for status. What is status in Canada? What is status in Canada? Status is, if you do not have status, you're, it means that you're to be denied. Not having status means you're denied basic human rights. If you don't have status, you're denied basic labor standards. So to be tied to your employer, to be denied basic human rights, denied basic labor standards, and above all, above all, to do their dirty jobs. That is what it is. So would, how would a website get to the root of that problem? And what is the root of, of the problem? It's that the, if the, the root of the problem is P, P, P. Our poverty in Canada is because of the unjust policies of the politicians. As, as far as I'm concerned, the website would help, but it, does not, it is like a band-aid. It does not get to the root of it. The root of the, the problem, the root solution, the cure for all, our Tylenol, our Advil is status. If I have status, it means that I have an open work permit and my employer would now know I have an open work permit. I can get a job anyway. So the pressure is now on my employer to create the conditions that would attract me and keep me. But to have a worker that's tied to you without, that's been denied basic human rights, basic labor side. What is that? That's a recipe for exploitation. And I do not see how a website would get to the root of it. It would be like a bandaid. And I would like to push everybody to take action to get to your politicians to, just, to change those unjust conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. You make so many good points there. Um, it's one piece of the puzzle, it sounds like you're saying, but it's not a solution. It's not a solution by any measure. Um, perhaps more resources are needed, language, uh, people, resources, places, et cetera, that they can reach out to to help them read contracts and stuff like that. Sounds like there's much more to this than, uh, uh, than meets the eye. And you alluded to something that leads me to the very next question. Uh, perhaps I'll ask one of the uh, other panelists to expand on this. So migrant workers, basically speaking, are like probationary workers whose probationary period never ends. So should status, shouldn't status be given to uh, these probationary workers at some point when the probation ends? Um, so I think you alluded to that fact already, Gabriel. Maybe I'll ask one of the other panelists to see what they think on that. This is to any panelist. Okay, so um, for me, you know that um, migrant worker, they spend most of their time right here in Canada, even in their own country. And for them to have status in Canada, that should be number one priority because um, they are here paying taxes and, and, and basically living, in, living here in Canada. So um, for them to have status, that should be number one. Also, um, yeah, basically that, yeah. 
Okay, thank you so much for sharing that. Can I add a little bit to that, please? Yes. I want to tell you to the average Canadian, status means being landed, being able to live in Canada. That's what, that's what status means to the average Canadian. There's nothing wrong with that. However, for a minute, I would like the viewers, everybody in Zoom land, everybody who's on tonight, to put yourself in a place of a migrant worker. Status is that one thing, status is that one thing that would help us to access decent work. Status is that one thing that would help us to access something close to equality. Status will help us by having an open work permit. By having an open work permit, it puts the pressure on our employer. That is that thing. That's what it is. That's, that's what it is a leverage, ne leverage neutralizer. That's what it is. That's what status means to us. Status to us is our union. We do non unionized work. That is the only thing that will give us the leverage that we have to negotiate and to, to put pressure on our, poly, on, our, on our employers. That's what status means to, 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 to migrant workers. And status is our union. That's what it is. And that is what the average Canadian do not understand. They only see it as oh, a pathway to citizenship and so on. Yes, it is true. But the work part of it, the, 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 the fact that we are denied basic human rights, basic labor standard, that is that tool. Status is that tool that would help us to access that. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Anyone else want to expand on that? Yeah. Go ahead, Alvar. Yeah, um, I think that the, the status is uh, it's very important because around the status, uh, we are creating um, social relationships that uh, it's giving form uh, all the problems that, that we have right now in, in Canada, you know, uh, as a migrant workers. Um, but even uh, uh, the unions uh, need to present a, a uh, a different effort uh, uh, and not just the status. So uh, I don't know, uh, uh, I, I just been thinking, uh, for example, what we do inside to the greenhouse with this kind of status that, uh, uh, give, uh, that keep us tied to the owners and don't give us chance for uh, find a, another kind of work. And it's a, uh, is totally bad, no? At the end of that process, we have depression, we have anxious, we have, a, a, I don't know, different kind of sickness, mental health, um, mental health problems, and we cannot resolve it uh, for, by ourselves. So uh, def definitely uh, change the status. It's uh, uh, an important thing in, in, for the migrant workers. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, Felicia? Yeah, I, I, I want to build on this topic because Gabriel put it really well that status is what's important and status is what is needed. Gabriel's also spoken about speaking to politicians and making sure that we are having our voices heard in that way. And about all you said it really well, unions need to do more in terms of how how labor supports migrant workers, how labor can support change in working conditions. But for the rest of us on this call, I don't believe all of us are from unions or necessarily from labor. What can we do to help? Um, what's the most important thing that we can do right now in terms of helping you with basic needs? Things like PPE, clothing, work boots, shoes, hats, culturally appropriate food, is there anything that you all can share with us that we can help you all with at this point in time? Who is the question addressed to, sorry? Anyone, give me, you usually jump in first. You go ahead. If you have an answer, go for it. We cannot talk about that if I don't use my props here right now. <laughs> <laughs> because tomorrow is a very important day. Tomorrow, the, the, the government is going to open a new door, right? What is that new door? 90,000 people, right? Isn't that a great thing? 90,000 people. In a, after a year of COVID where they said they failed, they did not meet the, the quota of, of um, immigrants, right? But they were 90,000 migrant workers. What is 90,000? compared to 400,000. This year, I think in the next three years, they said they're aiming at 400,000. 400, so 1.2 million in the next 
in the next three years, right? So what is 90,000 compared to 400,000 in one year? And knowing that the year before, they did not meet the quota. What is 90,000? But let, let me, let us, let us examine that a little. Out of the 90,000, the government is saying 40,000, 40,000 students. How many students come to Canada? I'm not sure. But out of 90,000, 40,000 would be for students. Okay? That leaves us if 50,000. Out of the 50,000, 20,000 would be from the healthcare. That leaves us if 30,000. And out of that 30,000, out of that 30,000, over a hundred different categories have to uh, have to compete for that 30,000 spots, including migrant workers, migrant agricultural workers. 30,000, we have to compete with a hundred other categories. And look at that, these two clear cut, these two other categories, the previous one, they were clear cut. This is for health people, this is for students, that's clear. But look at that. Migrant agricultural workers are lost or have to compete in a pool of over a hundred different categories. That's one. Now look at look at that. What is that pool? I have all different colors there. We, we, we are all in a mixed bag, right? But look at that. Migrant agricultural workers have to meet the nine categories, the nine requirements, like all other people, the nine requirements. And you know, some of these requirements are racial, some of them, uh, a deliberately set the bars are, are set at, at, at a level where they know that the workers will not meet it. So here's a carrot. Look, come and fight for the carrot. Hey, let me give you a simple example. There's a friend of mine. He's all the way in Windsor, and he has to do the what's it called the English evaluation test. I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with the acronym for that exam, but he he's all the way in Windsor. He's never been to uh, Toronto on his own, and yet still the only center where he can do that exam is in Barrie. How does he get there? When can he do that exam? All the way in June. When is the program starting? Tomorrow. And it's only a window of opportunity. That this here is clearly, is very, very clear to show how the government is stacking the cards against migrant agricultural workers. And a lot of that is based on our color. What can you do? What can you do in a situation like that? Call your politician. What can you do in a situation like that? Pressure your politicians. What can you do? Have your friends and families to pressure the politicians. The day workers stand united, that is the day Canada will change. Are you willing to do that? And that is what, how do you do that virtually, Mr. Moderator? How do you push people to take action? I want to push people in Zoom to take action. Call your politicians, change those unjust laws. And those injustices at every, every, every level of government. What are you willing to do? And that is why I'm happy to be here tonight. There's 101 things, but I do not want you to talk about uh, culturally appropriate food or the, these are banded stuff. These are important stuff, these are bandit, but get to the root of it. Get to the root of it, change the system and the system can be fair. On the world stage, Canada tells the world, it's a country of love. It's a country, it's a champion for human rights. Oh, diversity on the world stage, right? But I want you to remember that this red leaf in my country Red means danger. This red leaf is a constant reminder of those dangerous conditions that we face. What are you willing to do about it? Are you going to be a spectator? Or are you going to be a player? And I'm pretty sure if you're progressive, our tomorrow can be better than our today. What are you willing to do about it? Um, is it Napoleon who said, the world suffers a lot, not because of the wrongdoings of, of bad people, but because of the silence of good people. Are you going to wake up? Are you going to wake up? Tonight, I want you to think of ways and means to get people to take action. Because when people stand up, when workers stand up, we bring change. And the history is full of success stories. How did these success stories come about? Did you, do you think those success stories came about? Oh, the employer comes to work tomorrow and tells us, oh, everything is okay? Is that the, how we got success stories? No, by constant fight. And are we willing to fight? That is right. That is what I'm hoping to do. I don't know how to do that virtually, but I'm pushing you to take action. Thank you. Gabriel, you did it. <laughs> no band-aid solutions for you. You're not having it, and nor should you. So we've heard the challenge. The challenge has been sent to all of us to speak to family and friends, to contact our politicians, MPPs, MPs. And if you are part of a union, talk to your union about how you can add pressure. Are we coming up with a petition for our members? Are we coming up with some other type of direct action? So Gabriel has challenged us. It's so hard to ask another question after that. <laughs> Gabriel, you mic dropped it. 
I'm in. I'm looking to you for some support, brother. <laughs> What's left to answer? You're on mute. <laughs> There we go. You think I'd get the hang of it by now. I was just saying, um, being an advocate, being a social justice advocate for migrant workers and, and fighting for rights for migrant workers, it's a contact sport. It's just much like our national sport here in Canada, hockey, right? It's a contact sport. It should have more contact than that. When we say contact, we mean contact your politicians. That's what I heard Gabriel saying. Pick up a phone. Go to an office when obviously public health directives allow us to do so. Go visit your politician when we're allowed to do so. Pick up a phone, call them, take some action, you know, educate ourselves. Let's have forums like this where we can learn more about how best to help. Uh, of course, there's some, some solutions that are good, but there's some that are better. And as they were put their Band-Aid solutions, right? So let's uh, do our best to support migrant workers in the way that they need to be supported in the way that they want to be supported. So thank you very much to all of our panelists uh, and just being conscious of time. Uh, you know, we told everyone that we would uh, end at 830 promptly. Um, so uh, perhaps uh, this is a good uh, juncture where we can do that. Um, and before we do that, maybe I'll say any final thoughts from our panelists, Keisha, Tracy Ann, uh, Gabriel, uh, Alvaro, Anything else you want to leave us with before we uh, come to an, a close here? Well, for me, it's Keisha. I just Thank think you, it should be a very as that they should have people that are going into the workplaces and talking to like foreign workers to find out how are they getting treated and so on. Because a lot of foreign workers get it all fear, but because that they don't know who to talk to are the rights that they have that they don't know who to reach out to because all of what it was going through while it was down there. At no point I know who I could have talked to. And it was COVID at that time. So a lot of the places was closed down. I didn't know who to talk to, who I could call nor nothing like that. So a lot of people need to start going into like workplaces for the foreign workers again and letting the foreign workers know about we are here for you if you need to talk or whatever the case may be. And also it should be a very as that of like an open work permit is put in place for like some foreign workers because I think the employers know that we can't go no place else we're only limited to be working for that company that that's where a lot of employers are in uh, fearing a lot of foreign workers because we don't know our rights up there thank you very much Keisha Tracy Ann Okay, perhaps we'll come back to Tracy Ann if she wants to leave us with a final thought. Uh, Alvaro? Yes, um, well, uh, in my country, we have uh, uh, different organizations and, and try to do different things, but always uh, we find that uh, we cannot have a, uh, a grease in and a and some things, no? So some of these organizations start to thinking in to have agrees in the things that we are not agree. And I think is uh, one of the uh, principal thoughts that we have uh, for to go to the, the goals that, that, that we are thinking, no? Uh, for example, one of these goals, uh, sometimes it's just empathy. One of the, th the first things uh, or the reasons for why I'm here is because I was seeing the, the problems in, in my country and I was expecting that one day my daughter just going to growing up and I don't want to find it in a, in, in a back patch or uh, in the middle of the desert or disappear or, or something like that, no? So that's why uh, uh, I start to, uh, to thinking and coming here. And that's why uh, one of the reasons, but um, I, sometimes I ask myself, uh, what is happening if, if I was a woman? Is it possible to come here and say the things that I'm saying right now? I think no, because we don't have 
uh, enough women working in the greenhouse. We don't have equalities. We don't have justice. We don't have democracy. We don't have a lot of things. Probably for most of the organizations here in Canada, it's a, uh, we need to start thinking to fight against, uh, not just to the government, but we need to fight for democracy, uh, justice, and uh, well, things that we are thinking that are bas basics, you know, for the most of the people in the world, and it's not happening in, in Canada, for example, you no? Know? So uh, that's what, uh, one of the last thoughts that I have, and I want to keep, uh, keep that with me. Uh, if we uh, have a, uh, we need to have a grace in the things that we don't have a grace. No? Thank you very much for that, Alvaro. Also, one more thing from me. What I, have, what I would like to say also, I think something also needs to be done about staff housing. It's not fair for you have, let's say, 10 set of people in one house and everybody's paying one set of money. That's really too much money, right? That people paying and then to be living under them conditions that a lot of people living under. That is way too much. You don't have no sort of personal space at all. No place to make a personal phone call or nothing sort of to call to your family member or something like that. Something needs to be done about staff housing for farm workers. Thank you very much. Agreed. You're welcome. Well, can I add my little, my two yeah. cents? I wanted to remind everybody that the program, the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program, it's a government gift to farmers. And I told you a while ago, we are tied to our employer, at the same time being denied basic human rights, basic labor standards. So in all, in, in a nutshell, we have been milked, we have been milked by every stakeholder in the system. Are you going to be a spectator? Or are you going to be a player? I want to tell you that there are 20 injustices behind the fruits that we eat, the vegetables are, there are 20 injustices. I want to tell you that it is only our hands, the hands of migrant workers, only our hands are needed in Canada. I want you, I want to tell you now, I want you to examine your hands. There's power in your hands as a voter. I want to tell you that there's power in your hands as a consumer. I want to tell you there's power in your hands as a human being. I want you to discover that power tonight and use it to push the politicians to create a fair and a just system. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, final thought, Gabriel. And I'll circle back one more time to Tracy Ann if she does have a final thought, otherwise we'll we'll move forward here. Yes, I am here. Okay. So um, my final thought is that um, I, I recently, I know that now they have a, a open permit for migrant workers who are being abused um, um, in their workplace. So for me, that's to tell you that the government know that migrant workers are being abused. So I want the government to, to change their the system because it's obviously they know that the abuse is happening because if they didn't know, they would have come up with, with um, the open work permit. And also when migrant workers are, are injured, there's so many times because I have seen it for myself where workers are injured and and they they before they even get the chance to for WSIB um to get involved they are sent back and there should be a record of everything that happened in the workplace and the government should be able to receive those records to ensure that um, um injustice don't happen in the workplace and I have seen so many times um to know that because with me. I have seen where workers were 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 injured, and when um, WSIB, when they were sending um, the lab, um, somebody to inspect the place, the 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 employer hired a lot of person to cover up. So for me, I think they need to stop letting the employer know when they are coming to examine the place, to examine the the workplace because. When they know they are coming to examine the workplace, then they can able to cover the the their um what they are doing years after years. This program has been so long, and yet still you see so many injustice. 
I think it's time for, for, for all of this to stop. We have the next generation coming up and we don't want them to, to go through the same thing that we are going through. I have a, a, a four-year-old and I wouldn't want to know that when he, when he reached the age, the, this thing is still happening. And there are so many persons who know about all of this and yet still they, they are not, um, they're not speaking out. So um, for me, I am so glad for this opportunity so that I can able to share my experience and, and encourage even my own um, employee, employee um, that they, they should not be afraid to speak out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy Ann. Uh, and thank you to all our panelists. What a great evening of knowledge uh, and sharing and growth. These conversations are difficult, but necessary to have. They have to happen. Uh, you heard it here tonight from our panelists. Pick up a phone, call somebody, educate yourself. Uh, Band-Aid solutions can only go so far. We got to connect with our politicians, the policymakers. Uh, I'd like to thank our audacious speakers for guiding us through this conversation tonight and sharing the knowledge and experience uh, uh, of their work experiences uh, of being migrant workers themselves uh, here in, uh, on what we're calling modern day plantations. I'd like to thank my co-moderator, Felicia Samuel, for helping make this evening a success. Felicia, I hope it's been enriching uh, for you as much as it has been for me. 100% and the message to take away from here, each one teach one. There's so much that we can share with our coworkers, our friends and family. And we already heard, Amin, mean, you said it really great. No need for Band-Aid solutions. Let's all speak to a politician. I think that's one pledge that we can make. And if you're involved in your union, talk to your union about your union leadership, about how we can support, how we can bring our fellow unionists on board. I know I will be taking that back. So just to say, I've been inspired and thank you so much to all the panelists. I also would like to thank everyone who made this evening possible to our closed captioner. Thank you. Thank you for your contributions and assistance tonight. Thank you also to um, all the behind the people who did the work behind the scenes because it's not an easy task to plan a webinar. So thank you to the OFL, Justice uh, for Migrant Workers, Ryerson, UFCW, Migrant Workers Alliance, and CBTU staff. Thank you to all the team members that made this evening successful. And most importantly, to all the participants in attendance tonight, thank you so much for joining us. We hope this evening was rewarding and you are leaving with more answers than questions. And most of all, we hope that you're leaving with that call to action. I know I feel it in my spirit. It must be the props. Thanks, thanks, Gabriel. Thanks for all of that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. Thanks, Gabriel. And thanks to all of our panelists and participants you're tonight. Welcome. If you if you enjoyed this session with us here tonight, part two of this webinar series is uh, happening on Wednesday, May the 19th. At the same time, starting at 7 p.m., two weeks from tonight. Don't miss it. We are, we're inviting you. Be there. Make sure you sign up. Uh, we invite you to join the panelists from uh, leading this uh, provincial migrant worker advocacy organizations and exploring pathways in uh, to eliminating uh, experiences, these negative experiences that we've heard about uh, from migrant workers from our panelists here tonight, including permanent status on arrival versus pathways to permanent residency and the groundwork that needs to be laid to remove the systemic barriers hindering migrant worker success. Uh, you can find more information on all of this um, at uh, powerofmany.ca. Uh, um, please make sure you visit the website. Please make sure you sign up for the next event. Uh, and again, thank you to everybody involved. Uh, and thank you, uh, special thank you um, to uh, Ogo Ikalo. Uh, she opened up for us here today. Um, she makes it all look easy and makes it all look like it runs smooth. And that's because of uh, her hard work and dedication and the rest of our staff as well, Melissa Palermo. And I'm so sorry, I don't wanna miss anybody. So I'm gonna stop naming people, but um, thank you so much for joining us and good night. Good night. Thank you, you're welcome.